Hello and welcome. This video is going to be a books without barcodes and for the video today I will be reviewing The Magic Goes Away by Larry Niven. This, or Larry Niven, well to be honest that's not his full name anyway, but I got this uh, because of the fact that it is gorgeously illustrated. When I did the book haul with this book in it, y'all told me that this was something that was tried in the late 70s, early 80s, and it just didn't catch on. But you know, now graphic novels and manga are like a giant thing. So technically this was just a book ahead of its time. So The Magic Goes Away was originally published as a short story in 1976. It was then expanded into a novella in 1978. And this particular copy with its absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous illustrations, was mass marketed in 1979. A little bit about the author before I get into my review is Larry Niven was born Lawrence Van Cott Niven in 1938. I may have mispronounced that. Please forgive me. He's still alive and actively writing. He is most well known for the book Ringworld as well as The Moat in God's Eye which he co-authored with Pornell. This book, unfortunately, I can state that I I finished it and I'm glad I finished it. I did not like it. <laughs> I, I did not. <laughs> so this book, it, it focuses on, you get introduced initially to the character Orlandes, which, or Orlandes, I don't know what the Greek pronunciation is supposed to be, because he's supposed to be a Grecian warrior that has been washed ashore into a fisherman's town on a roof raft that came from the city of Atlantis, which the Grecians tried to overthrow. Uh, and when they overthrew the city, the city of Atlantis then sank into the sea, killing all of the inhabitants, as Orlandes is the reason why it sank into the sea. He is filled with great grief because he thought he was becoming a conquering hero. He was just a, uh, a, a soldier. He didn't realize that what they were doing was going to end all life in the city. Like it wasn't, you know, they fought the army, they killed the army, and then they take over the city. It was a, a secession of all life on in Atlantis because it fell into the sea. So not only did his army perish, but everyone in Atlantis, including his army, perished and he just happened to live uh, when he floated on this roof. He floated on this roof with this, um, centaur girl which died shortly after Atlanta sank and he goes to this fishing village and lives without speaking because he's overcome with the weight on his soul that you know he murdered an entire city and just ended an entire civilization or took participated in ending an entire civilization and he hears these murmurings of like magicians and, and Priest Hill or Priest Hill, which is the city of magicians. And when he gets to Priest Hill after doing his journey, uh, he comes across four other magicians that are the other four characters. It is Warlock, who is a warlock. And the, in the Vin mentions that, you know, if I, if I had known that that would have become the name for all male magicians, I wouldn't have named myself Warlock, which was just kind of unnecessary. Uh, and also like, it was a little fourth wall. It, there were several instances in this book where that was just like, it just broke me instantly out of the story. I'll get into that a little later. There's Clubfoot, who has a clubfoot, the most, <laughs> the most imaginative of names. And he is an indigenous person from the Americas. We have Wavy Hill, who Clubfoot and Warlock revive, um, who is a former necromancer that Warlock actually killed in a previous generation lifetime. Uh, it, Warlock's been alive for a couple hundred years. It, Wavy Hill was one of his nemesis, and they, they bring him back to life. Uh, and then Mirandi joins them as well. And the reason why they do this is because the magic has gone away. It is going away 
in what seems to be Earth. Just a regular Earth. It, it mentions Australia's and I guess maybe I'm just a little bit too picky. When I want it to be a fantasy world, it either needs to be like far in the past with some historical context that can be... I don't know. I don't know what it is because, you know, I've... You know, King Arthur and King Arthur's Court, like that kind of thing. I think that's because it's always been treated as a fairy tale in my lifetime. If somebody does something like in the British Isles and it's it's a fairy tale fairy tale type story or a fantasy type story that takes place in King Arthur's Court. I don't have a problem with uh, suspending disbelief. You know, I've talked about this multiple times, like Christopher Sashi's book, Her Majesty's Wizard, which I have Stegum and Tattoo to my arm, is basically like an another dimension or another realities version of Europe. Like 15th and 16th century Europe. Um, I, I don't have, but everything's named differently. Like it's the same, but different. I don't know what it is about how Niven incorporated earth into this book that just took me out of the story every time he mentioned it. Like I could start suspending disbelief and just think this is like a fantasy world. And then he would mention the Americas or then he would mention like Australia. And it just immediately went like, eh. Like that, that's how I felt. I was like, okay, this is good. And then I was like, eh. <laughs> I don't know what it was about it. Um, also, uh, the illustrations were very they're very beautiful. They're very much indicative of comics of that era. Just absolutely beautiful, interesting. But what I didn't like about it is that I guess it's because I'm so used to, to reading graphic novels and manga is that it would describe like the person that it was introducing or the place or the scene and then the picture of that exact thing would be right next to it. So it's like the picture I just built in my head of what the scene was, was then immediately erased by the illustration next to it. It was immediately supplanted, which also kept taking me out of the world because I am blessed in being one of those people that can see when I'm reading an entire movie going as I'm reading. So, you know, someone for someone who, like my brother who who doesn't really see the pictures when he reads, this would be great because it's like he's reading the thing and then that happens. So if they were trying to like engage those type of readers to this type of book, awesome. And if you were one of those people who like reading and, and wanted to experience that, I feel like a lot of those people turn to graphic novels and manga. This, this type of book would be great for you. But for me as someone who can fully flush everything out seeing a picture of something next to this just supplants that immediately and it just kind of ruins the experience for me so i found the illustrations more as a distraction and not an addition to the story and you know i'm a little bit spoiled being someone you know in the 2000s being able to have manga and graphic novels as something that I have grown up with but it's just it's not like they didn't have something similar so like if you have children's books children's books are the same way of like graphic novels and in manga in a sense where there is a picture but there's not really a descriptor it's like the boy plays with the girl and then you see a boy and a girl like playing doing something so like it's not descriptive enough to be distracting when you have an illustration. This is supposed to be an allegory for the energy crisis. So in 1973 and in 1978 there was a severe oil crisis and gas shortages. I know that because my parents have talked about it multiple times. Um, and this is the the premise of this book is the magic goes away. So in most fantasy realms, which I, I grant is quite novel and different than most fantasy realms where like the world is full of magic and there are people that are just blessed with the ability to tap into magic and have innate magical powers and they do the magic and whatever. In this world, 
the magic is finite. So whenever a magician or a, a sorceress or sorcerer or warlock or whatever you want to call them does magic, it uses up the mana in the world. It uses up that resource. And that is the issue. It's like after a thousand years of magic use in this world, it's run out. It's running out. It's run out. And they are trying to figure out a way to bring magic back to the world. And they go on this long quest that involves flying on a cloud and climbing up mountains and reviving a dead god. And there was one sex scene in this book that was then illustrated on the next page that I audibly guffawed. And I haven't just laughed that hard at something so ridiculous in such a long time. <laughs> if y'all have ever seen, what is that movie? Don't, don't keep baby in the corner. What is that movie? I'm not going to remember what, I, I'm not going to be able to remember what the movie's name is. I'll just put it over here. But there's that scene when Patrick Swayze is lifting baby up in the thing. And that was like the illustrated sex scene. And it was just, ridiculous I could I like I'm like blushing and also laughing at the same time because it was just random and weird and I <laughs> so let's go back to the the dead god that they're trying to revive this dead god and that's another thing that I had issue with in this like Nevin made sure to state that Razkati which is the the god of love and madness that they're trying to resurrect which is the god of love and madness for, for the frost giants which are in this world and he made it such a strong point to to state that this god was intersex that they were both aspects of male and female and then after introducing this god spent the rest of the bloody book <laughs> referring to rose kati as he him like you literally spent this chunk of pages talking about how this this god was both had aspects of both male and female was completely intersect had both parts and then even later on in the book when they finally find the god like also made a, a statement that that the god had both parts but then to just automatically default to he him his why make such a big deal about the god being intersex and then completely dissolve that later on i'm sure that might have that might have just been it's a being of power so Naven automatically just went to male <laughs> but it, it just also as someone who is a modern reader took me out of the story it just annoyed me it wasn't like even if Naven just like put he him or then her like just randomly throughout just like interchange the pronouns as they as Naven went through the story I would have been totally fine sometimes it was he him his sometimes it was she her hers but no after he made such a big point to talk about how intersex this god was just he him his and it just it was just like even when they were describing the god's vagina and every illustration depicted boobies of this god nope nope <laughs> just that's, that's that was just like uh, there's just so many issues about that it's you know a book from this it's a novella from the 70s that they illustrated it's a little fantasy book i think it's a really cool piece of literature history because of the fact that this is like one of the early illustrative novels of the time uh, and it is from a well-celebrated author it does deal with a really cool premise, you know, with being an allegory for the energy crisis time, especially considering that Naven is the great grandson of Doheny, who is an oil tycoon that was also <laughs> implicated in the Teapot Dome scandal, and he was one of the first people to to drill and successfully well in the Los Angeles oil field, which Naven is from California. So, like, a little bit of irony there that someone who was the grandson of a giant oil tycoon in California was trying to make a fantasy allegory of an energy crisis from the oil crises that were stemming in that time. I 
found that part neat, but that isn't something that you would know unless you like did more looking into it. I mean, I could understand that there was an energy crisis and that it being novel in of itself, the fact that its mana is finite, which is not normally something that fantasy worlds deal with because, you know, it's magic. Magic is supposed to be magic. So I thought that was kind of cool. I'm glad I got to read it. I'm ang I am glad that I found this. Um, I do hope that Ringworld and Emo the Moat in God's Eye are a little bit uh, better uh, examples of his work. I do, I think, have both of those somewhere in the many of <laughs> many piles of books that I have in my TBR but if you do want this for yourself I will be selling it so that'll be a link down below it'll be cheap because I'm just trying to pass off as a fellow bibliophile pass off something here that I didn't particularly like but maybe you as a collector would like to you and I will see you guys in another week for another review and I hope you guys enjoyed this until then